Friday, yay! So um, it's going to be a rainy day here in Maryland, and I love it. I love it. I need to get out and walk because, to be honest, I haven't been outside enough this week. Like, I should be and like I know I want to be. And it got me thinking this morning, you know, when I talk about move your body, and uh, I get it. I get that we all get so busy that we just don't want to get up and move or that we're in pain and we don't want to get up and move. There's so much going on. But, guys, really, it's so important. And the more I listen to, like, neuroscientists and uh, people who are brain specialists, not just about weight and uh, insulin resistance, they all talk about how important movement is for our brain, for our well-being, and just our overall health. So I'm going to invite everybody today to get off your butts and go take a walk, go do something that makes you happy. Actually, this morning, I'm like, I need to... My, my daughter and I challenge each other and it helps keep us accountable. How many of you guys have accountability partners when you do something? Because sometimes our own willpower is not enough and we need the encouragement and uh, what is it? Um, inspiration from other people. So I'm all about finding accountability partners, whatever it is you're doing, like even in, in business or with self-help stuff, I will find an accountability partner to to like say, okay, we're going to do this. You keep me accountable. I'll keep you accountable. And it really works. Cause on the days when you're like, I just don't want to, you know, that somebody's out there looking for you. So just check, check that out. Just completed a three day fast. Yes. Yay. I actually woke up this morning and I'm on day five of my, th my five day fast. So I'm going to make sure this afternoon that I have all the right foods and I need to, honestly, I need to go back over it because this whole like extended fasting thing is still a bit new to me. So I do have some like avocados in there and some olives. Um, so tomorrow I will be breaking my fast. I'll be doing a video over the next few days. I still have day four, day five, and then I'll do the breaking the fast video, but I'll try and video what I'm, what I'm eating to break my fast for that for you guys. But it's going to be a lot of Foods that are easy on the digestive system, break down easily in the system, things that are high in fats and uh, high in proteins that are not hard to digest. So I do have some berries and pears because, you know, I'm, I'm all about those for fibers and whatnot. I will reintroduce my fiber tomorrow slowly. And uh, yeah, it'll be, it'll be good. I mean, I've, I've refed several times, um, one time not so successfully because I ended up getting really hungry and just ate way too much. Um, that was more mental than physical, by the way. So this whole thing of fasting, that's a good point. This whole thing of fasting um, is really, really good for your mental state as well. Because the more that you... The more that you set a goal, the more that you do something and you complete that goal, the more likely you are to complete your next goal. Every time you give up on yourself, which is a good reminder for me this morning, I'm thinking in the back of my head, like, dude, listen to yourself. But every time you complete a challenge, it's, it's building that character and strength. And every time you let yourself slip, you're building that part in your brain that says it's okay. It's okay to quit because I've done it so many times before and I didn't die. So you want to train yourself to be successful. So I committed to a five-day fast and trust me, there, there were moments in this morning I'm like, I, I really, I let the, the, uh, <laughs> the promise of amazing food get to me, right? Because I, I'm like everybody else or like most other people, I love food. So, um. Janice did double chicken and avocado and broccoli. So that sounds good. I know like for me, because my fast is a little bit longer. So every like 36 hours you're on a fast, the, the more careful you have to be with refeeding and the, uh, the more amount of time. So Saturday will be a really gentle day. Sunday, I should be, go, be able to go back to eating normally. Um, if I had meats tomorrow, it would probably be ground. Um, I may have some eggs later in the day, but definitely my first meal will be something with like the avocado. By the way, there's, this is not high protein and high fat, but 
I've been wanting it and I feel like it's a healthier choice. I cannot even say it. There's an Indian salad and this is going to sound weird because it sounded weird to me, but I tried it the last time we went to this amazing Indian restaurant in town, but it's got fried spinach leaves in it. It's got a little bit of yogurt on it. It's got a lot of, of vegetables and stuff in it. It's a vegan dish. Amazing. Amazing. And I can't imagine anything better to start reintroducing food tomorrow with than a salad like that. It's just the the way they fry the spinach leaves, it makes them very crispy, like very thin chips, but it's spinach and yum, you guys. Yum, yum, yum. Okay, so I got to stop talking about it. You know tomorrow that's what I'm going to be getting, right? Um, all right. So I actually feel really great outside of the mental aspect of me being like, I want something really delicious. Um, the body feels amazing and it always does when I fast. It's always the mental aspect that's the toughest for me. So that's where, again, Janice, I'm sure, did you use the tea when you were fasting, Janice, or did you just do water? Because I will drink the tea. I'm My ketones are probably around three this morning when I read them, right, just right under three. Inflammation has gone down in my body. Um, it's interesting to see the places that, for me, when I know that I've lost any weight right now in this, I know that it's all inflammation. So I like to take measurements and see and pay attention to where my body's holding on to that inflammation when I'm not fasting. Because that's a piece of your health that you want to pay attention to. It's going to give you clues as to what you might need to address, where things are going wrong in your body and, and what, you know, what you can do better with when you're not in a full on fast. So couple of hints and tips, you guys. Maybe I should put those in the video, but I really, 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 really love this extended fast. No, not everybody has to do it. Um, it's also interesting to me that I'm going to repost that video today, but about a year, two years ago, I had done a video with a lovely friend of mine from England who's a type one diabetic, and she had fasted for 27 hours. A type one diabetic fasted for 27 hours. Now, did she do it when she first started? No. She had been on the system for a while. And then when she got her insulin levels under control because her blood sugar levels were not spiking rapidly, which this happens to type 1 as well as it does to us, um, the rest of us, she was able to fast for 27 hours with no adverse effects, no lethargy, no brain fog, no headaches, no, you know, none of any of that. Yeah. You know, so Janice, I'm going to start doing, I think I mentioned it yesterday. I'm going to start doing a fast. I had planned to do it this last year, but I'm going to commit to doing a five day fast at the first of the month, every month, beginning January one. Now I'm going to be traveling to Turkey. Um, so like after Thanksgiving and December 1st, I will be traveling into an amazing place. And I don't want to be fasting when I'm someplace where I can try out the world, right? I don't want to just see the world. I want to be able to experience the world. So I'm not going to fast at the beginning of that month. I may do it before Thanksgiving, but after the first of the year, I'll be doing a three to five day fast every month at the beginning of the month. And I'd love to get a group of us together that would like to do that. Now, one of the other comments I had was, um, okay, so somebody asked if fasting for, for was okay for diabetics. For both type one and type two, it is with type one, I would definitely, definitely, I mean, anybody should be checking with their physician, especially if they have any severe health issues. But type one, I would definitely be, you know, on board with your healthcare professional. But yes, um, now type one, I don't, I don't know how they would do. Honestly, I don't know how they would do on a, on a five day or a three day fast. I cannot answer that. Um, so trying to adjust your sugar. So um, be careful of doing extended fasts too often. A three day shouldn't be bad. Uh, next Saturday, about a week away, you know, there's, I'm going to do some videos this next week on some other styles of fasting that we can help use to break up the 16, eight fast. And, um, I'm really interested in that because I believe in doing that. I would probably wait two weeks to do the three day fast. There's things like a 5-2 fast, Janice, you might look at, where you you do a 24-hour fast um, on two days during the week, and you allow yourself to eat on the other five days. 
So like for me, Saturday is never a good day to do it because my grandson is generally here. But you know, when he leaves, that's a good day for me to fast, right? So for me, it may, might look like Monday, Thursday, I'm going to probably play with doing a longer fast where I don't eat anything all day um, Thursday. It'll end up a little bit longer than 24 because it'll probably be closer to 48 for me, but or 36. Eat breakfast and lunch, no dinner for longer fast. So I don't understand that. How does, how does, how does eating breakfast and lunch with no dinner equate to a longer fast? I, I, I'm not visualizing what you're trying to talk about. I don't see that. Um, I know I can, you can have tea and stuff, um, but full on eating, I don't, you're not going to get into autophagy. Um, the 16, eight fast will regulate your sugars like that, but so the five, two fast is another one where you're going to do a 16, eight fast on those five days. So like for me, Monday in a normal week, I would probably do a, a day without ingesting food, just my tea and maybe my, um, my, uh, pre-meal drink because it has, it's a probiotic or prebiotic, right? So I might have that on Mondays and then, okay. So let's talk about that after I finish this with the five, two. So Monday, I'll do a longer fast, probably Tuesday, Wednesday, I'll, I'll eat as I like Tuesday, heavily on proteins and fats. Um, and th like the second meal of Tuesday and the first meal of Wednesday, this gets a little complicated. I'll, I'll allow myself carbs back off of them Wednesday night, have I fast on Thursday, then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, eat what I like maybe even just do a 12 hour fast one of those days with the grandson. And that will help um, my body start to be like, Ooh, pay attention again and uh, not settle into some, some um, routine. Yeah. So one of the things Janice, I did before this, this five day fast that I'm doing now, one of the things I started doing, and again, I'm going to, I'm going to do some name dropping because I do listen to a lot of people and before I say that, I want to say one thing, you guys understand. I don't understand why people think that you have to agree with everything someone says to agree with some of what they say, because our entire life is filled with people we love, we admire, we um, revere, and we don't agree with everything they say, but we agree with most of what they say, or sometimes just some of what they say. We still like them as a person and we still agree with and can utilize some of what they say. Okay. So let's talk about that. Now, like Brian Johnson, I don't know if you guys all know who he is. He had um, Venmo, sold it, made millions of dollars, now spends about $2, millions, uh, $2 million a year um, anti-aging, age reversing. So I watched some of his um, pod or vlogs, video, video podcasts uh, about what he does and how he does it. And it's pretty amazing. And I agree with a lot of stuff he does. It's some of it's pretty much over the top for most people. But one thing he talked about is, and I've heard this multiple times, even from Dr. Bickman, that we do the 16-8 fast the way we do it. We do it at having our first meal at lunch and our last meal at dinner for this reason. Because most of us have families and the one time we're all sitting down together is at dinner. So that's the big basis for the our timeline that we have shifted for the 16-8 because we want this to be realistic for people. Most people are getting up in the morning and running and they're not spending a lot of time with family and all that. So it's easy to skip breakfast and not have that communion, that family time. But really for your algorithm and for a number of other reasons, um, to do the fast in the morning, so start your breakfast in the morning, whatever time that looks like for you and stop eating within like six to eight hours before you go to bed is is they're saying is healthier. Brian is saying it's because it's giving his gut a rest. Like he's getting out of that high sugar stage. He's getting out of that high insulin stage. And now when his gut is resting, he's also resting. And so he feels like it gives him more regenerative properties because it's not like my gut's resting, but my body's working. Okay. So his body is still working, 
while he has the sugar in his system. So being more insulin sensitive while that sugar is still coming down out of your system and then resting when the sugar has gone out and the HGH and the ketones and, and all, and the glucagon are starting to come out so that it makes more use of the fast. So that's, that's probably where Jim is going with that. And, um, I would totally agree with that. I had started shifting my eating patterns before this. Um, I love dinner time, but I I'm, I'm was shifting for those reasons, right? For the health of my body to morning. So I had gotten to the point where I was having my breakfast at 10 because my morning's kind of jam-packed. I get up at 5, 5.30 and I'm moving and doing stuff until I hop on here. And oftentimes I'm late because I'm running late with trying to get all my stuff done. So trying to put a meal in there is not feasible for me right now. So normally after this live stream, then I usually go on a normal day would go like make my eggs and my sausage and have my breakfast and then go for a walk. Yes. So I was having my meal, my second meal around four because I have a live stream at three and I didn't want to eat at two because that's just too soon for me. I like to have that longer space in between. So and until I can get to a point where I can have breakfast before this live, then I would have my dinner before the second live and then be done. But I agree with what Jim is saying. And I do feel, um, according to what scientists and, and other people who have actually lived the lifestyle say, that doing that morning free feed is uh, making you more insulin sensitive. So there's a tip in that. Now, um, it, it's not necessary, though, guys. Don't get scared and be like, oh, my gosh. There's too much stuff. I was speaking with um, a customer last night and we were talking about the fact that this is meant to be sustainable. In fact, I want to talk about that a little bit this morning if I can. Um, one of them had got the system and I see this a lot. People get the system and then they're like, oh, I have this wedding or I have this event or I have this birthday thing to go to. And so they drop off the system and then I have something all over my shirt. And then they go off the system because they, they feel like they can't enjoy themselves on vacation or at an event while they're on the protocol, right? Yeah. So Janice, you might need to be, and I'm sure Jim has talked to you about this, but you might have to keep your, um, you might be one of the people who really needs keto and that you might have to drop down to like that 20, 30 grams of carbohydrates a day, which is, you know, like some spinach or a cup of broccoli, right? So, but Janice, you're retraining your body to be more insulin sensitive. So yeah, um, the longer, the longer you're insulin resistant, and the longer you have excess weight on, the longer you have any of these health issues, the longer it's going to take your body to heal from it, okay? So if you guys think about, if I go out and stack a couple of bricks, okay? Yeah, it takes me a couple of hours. I stack some bricks because I'm going to build a wall. It's really easy the next day to go down and tear that down, right? But if I were to build, I don't know, a 10, 11-story building and mortar all the bricks together and put all the stuff together it's going to take me a long time to manually tear that building down, right? We need to start understanding our health in that way. We live in this quick fix society of, um, I damaged myself over 30 years and I, I didn't give a, sorry you guys for my language, but I didn't give a shit about what I was doing for 30 years. And now I want something to fix me today because I care about it today. This is your real health comes when you really pay attention day to day. And real health does not come from a pill or a shot. It comes from addressing the root causes and starting to make those changes and allowing the body to heal. I'll talk about those shots if somebody reminds me later because it just blows my mind that we have this society where we allow these people who are making money off of our illness and making us sicker to be so, so damn profitable and be billionaires over making you sick and taking an illness like insulin resistance and literally killing people with it. So, um, yep, it takes time. And I wish more people would understand that and just have some patience. Like, you know, I've had such great results with this fast and I'm like, I want to, I want to keep going. 
but I'm like, no, you need, you need to learn some patience because I'm a very, I'm more patient than I used to be, but I'm a very impatient person. <laughs> Ask anybody who loves me and they will tell you I'm a, I'm a somewhat impatient person, or I should say I get really excited about the things I get excited about. I, I, I just can't contain it. That's, that's my personality. But I know that doing five day fasts once a month, I was doing crafts again, um, will be healthier for me than trying to do stuff that's unsustainable and throw me off into um, rebounding and all of that. Right. They love that ideology. The, the pharmaceutical companies will give you a pill to fix the problem. So Josh says a simple pill won't fix the problem. The pharmaceutical company, companies love that ideology. You guys have to know, I had two family members who were in pharmacology uh, as sales reps and the amount of education they had to do for those drugs so that they could teach the doctors about the drugs and go in and talk to them and tell the doctors why they should prescribe them and sell the doctors on the drugs was insane. And in fact, for one of the family members, it made them a bit... Um, hyper, I'm trying to find the right word, hypo, hypochondriacal. So they be, they kind of became a hypochondriac because they started stuff and all these things, the pills could fix and They're like, well, I kind of have that. And I kind of have that. And it comes a really thing, but they're really, really trained to sell the drugs, right? Because of course, that's how pharma, pharma, pharmaceuticals are making their money is by selling you that product. Like they're not going to be in business to not make money. So I'm not faulting that, but I'm faulting the fact that they've kind of lost their way. And not, it's not so much like I want to, I want to help people get better to how I, I want to make money. And so I'm going to profit off of the use of, you know, of this promising people a quick fix. Okay. Yeah. So Janice, she, Janice says she gets it now. Her body was so sick for a long time. Uh, and she also says, I couldn't believe people were healed in a few weeks and I was taking so long. Right. So, and that's, I like to talk about that because there are some people, especially we look at like some of the younger people I would consider younger because I'm 59. Maybe they're in their, their thirties who are doing the system or young women who have PCOS and they're on the system in their twenties and their periods which starts dropping and they're pregnant within three months. Well, They've had less life to be sick, right? Janice, you do not look 67, honey. You do not look 67. But you know what? Since I started the protocol, since I started understanding insulin resistance, since I started getting my health back through this, I'm like, I am so ready to be 60 because I'm kind of happy about the state I'm in at 60 as opposed to where I thought I would be at 60. So um, I'm really happy with it and I look forward to it now. And like I, you guys... I will say it all the time because I think it's important for people to understand uh, some things, some quirks, but I am autistic. So I obsess over some things. So some nights I sit down and I think about how long I want to live, how many years I have left um, and how, you know, what I have left to do in my life. But one of the good things is when I look at, okay, I want to live to be over a hundred. Shoot. I'm just barely halfway through my life. Why do we at 60 years old start to act like, oh, life is over. Holy cow, we spent the first 20 years of our life learning how to live life. We have a few years where we're still learning how to live life, but we're abusing our bodies. Finally, at this age, we're like, hey, hold up. I understand life. I understand so much now, and I'm not abusing my body. And I, and I want, I have the means and the mentality to help and do good in life. Why do we start feeling like that's the end of life? We shouldn't. We shouldn't. And, you know, but I was because I was so sick and I was overweight and a walker and a cane and disability plates and I was in pain and my joints were failing. I've had two hips replaced and a knee replaced and I was like, I I'm done. I just don't want to be this way anymore. Thanks, Josh. So Josh, Josh said, I speak with so much truth. And Janice says her life has just started. Guys, I'm on Facebook and YouTube as as well as TikTok. So I got to remember that I can see all the comments. Um, but I really feel like 
sometimes we do just need that push though. Janice, how did you feel before you started the protocol, before Jim started working with you on insulin resistance and, um, and overcoming all of this in your life? And by the way, I don't think I read your numbers. I want to let people know that too. So it took you nine months, but you went from 7.8 to 5.8. I missed a few things here. Um, he, and your, your coach, we're both coaches has you on keto. It's not hard for you to do this protocol. She's been 20 years as a diabetic and she was on 2000, uh, milligrams of metformin and Genuvia. So that's crazy that you're, you're off of all those. So I will say I'm not a proponent of medications. I say this all the time, right? I am not a proponent. There's a time and place for them. I take Tylenol. I have um, nasal pressure this morning. I'm still adjusting to the East Coast, the barometric pressure, the allergies. Um, I'm doing much better than I thought I would. But I have a little bit of a nasal headache. Plus, I'm fasting. Plus, I started doing bioidentical hormones this last month. All of that combined. So I did take some Tylenol this morning. But as far as, uh, so that that's helpful, right? I don't like to take those either. I try to do other things. But out of all the drugs for diabetes and, and I don't know if they're prescribing it for weight loss so much as the other ones. It's probably the safest. According to Dr. Bickman, it's probably the safest. It's still not one that, that I like for, I just don't like medications. I mean, I think we're, we're doing well with healing it with food. So, and Janice says before she started the protocol, she was, I was so freaking tired and I felt so fatigued all the time. I need to get pictures of you and get your story, Janice. So I need to put it in my slides. Are we okay with that? You want? Can you get a hold of me and and then I would love to highlight you on on some of these success stories as well. Um, so she's lost fifty nine pounds. So nine months and she's down fifty nine pounds. Somebody's been type two diabetic for twenty years, struggled with weight loss and fatigue. And I tell me what else you were struggling with because I you're here all the time and I appreciate you so much. Um, but those are all things many of us suffer with. So I'm going to, I don't know if I have my list. You guys, I can never remember all the stuff right here is part of, part of the list. So for me, for me, I had to make a list as I started realizing what was getting better. And I like to look at this list every once in a while because human brain, we like to think, oh, I'm feeling good. Everything is good. And we forget about the things that hurt. And then we stop. Oh, lotion. I put lotion on. Um, and then we stop understanding how far we've come. Okay. So Janice says, she, uh, Tanya Lee says she's dead and still on Jardians, but that will come, right? That will come. Um, Janice, Jeep girl has lost five pounds in her first week. Woo! That's amazing. And then Janice has lost IBS of 20 years, acid reflux for seven years. And that was healed in two months. You guys, and I, I do talk about this somewhat because when we start to get our gut microbiome in order, when we start to get the insulin down, which is causing the gut microbiome to be off, which is causing us to have inflammation, which is causing us to store inflammatory proteins and do all of these things, all of those symptoms start to get better. And I didn't know it when I started the protocol. Nobody was talking about all these things when I started. I started realizing and talking about it because I started getting better. And I'm like, whoa, what happened? Literally at that point, the only thing I had changed in my life, I wasn't doing excess. I hadn't done a cleanse. I didn't do any of that stuff. And yet I'm having all of these amazing results over the landscape of my health. And I'm like, what happened? And the only thing that happened was I started the protocol that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. So Janice said she had chronic fatigue and depression for 20 years and that's gone. You guys, I know that some people don't like the term adrenal fatigue, but I think we all understand what that means when we say that, right? That we're stressed. We have cortisol levels that are too high. Adrenal fatigue to me means that we're stressing our adrenals. It's making us fatigued. So I'm going to look at it. Okay. So, um, for me, I'm not taking naps multiple times a day. There was a point in time where mine was so bad when I was working in medical offices, I would, um, and I worked two jobs. So yes, I was fatigued, but 
I would go into the medical office and as soon as we could leave for lunch, I didn't even eat lunch most days. And if I did, it was something very simple because I would run out to the car. I would, um, in the wintertime, the car's on, both times the car's on because in the wintertime, the heater's on in North Idaho. And in the, in the summertime, the air conditioner's on. But I would literally have like a blanket, something over my eyes, have an alarm on my phone and I would kick the seat back and pass out. My body was exhausted. I really like I felt sick and tired from the inside out. My whole body hurt. And so then I would like wake up, dust my face off and run back into the office just in time to go start taking care of patients again. And then after work, when I was training to be a world, when I was training as an as an athlete um, for those world championships, I would have my bag in the car. I would drive over to the gym. I would do the same thing. I would get to the gym and I'm like, man, I am so tired. I cannot lift today if I don't rest. So I, I wouldn't set an alarm, but I would just kick my seat back and I would like pass out in front of the gym. So many people saw me walking into the gym, just passed out in my car. And they're like, what the hell is Misha doing? And then when I would wake up, I would like wash my face off, run in, change my clothes, go do my squat workout, my deadlift workout, my bench workout, whatever I was doing for the day, work out for two to three hours. And then I would run home, get showered, and then I would go to the next job. I don't feel that way anymore. But by the way, that was where I started this morning. I think one of my old powerlifting coaches and world champion wrote me, and we haven't talked for a while, and some devastating things had happened to them. But it reignited to me that I really need to do more activity than just the walking. So I'm going to start lifting again, not not at the level that I was when I was a powerlifter. But let's talk about this because... Like Jason said, I'm always on a tangent. Y'all listen to me and y'all know I'm going to go on tangents. So we're all here, right? But ladies, especially ladies in their late 40s and and 50s, I want you to understand this. I'm not going to get the numbers right because it's been more than 20 years since I read this research and did this paper and did all of this stuff on um, lifting and osteoporosis in women. But there was a study. And so a group of women didn't change anything. A group of women did cardio and a group of women did um, light, light weight bearing exercise. And the thing was, is that the women who didn't anything do do anything were losing bone mass at a rapid rate. The women who did cardio were actually starting to maintain their bone mass. But the women who um, were doing light weight bearing exercise at these ages started gaining it was minimal but it was they were gaining bone mass so their bones then would stay stronger there is a reason why heavier women have less problem with broken bones in older age than thin women that's i don't i'm not encouraging anyone to be heavy but i'm what i'm saying is that some light weight bearing for menopausal postmenopausal premenopausal women, some light weight bearing exercise, just good for your metabolism, not just good for your muscles, but it's going to stave off those, those broken bones, the brittle bones as you age. And so does reversing your insulin resistance. So those six simple tips that I talk about six, six, why did I put up four? those six simple tips that I talk about. And the last one is move your body. Um, and I always say, you don't have to do weight bearing, but if you're a menopausal, postmenopausal, anywhere in that age, menopausal is part of your life somehow. Um, do some lightweight bearing exercise. It will help you with both the insulin sensitivity and it will help you with your bone health on a number of fronts. So there's that. So um, Janice, we talked about the chronic fatigue, gone, no meds for chronic fatigue. Uh, Jeep girl says her son was told his cholesterol is 246. Holy smokes. How old is your son? And I love, um, so Jeep girl, my grandson is ADHD. So he does the system, by the way, this works wonders because we're working on, um, pathways in the brain. Okay. But it's, I have an 11 year old granddaughter who does it. Who's her. I don't think her, her cholesterol panel was that high, but she was pre-diabetic. And so as long as they can drink it, they can do it. Now, my 11-year-old granddaughter does a full dose of the balance before her meals. Um, and it's worked so well for her in tandem with some light keto that she is now, my daughter's worried about her getting a little um, 
too addicted. And so she's trying to reintroduce some healthy foods and she's also running uh, cross country. And so they want to make sure that her caloric intake, this is where it does matter, is appropriate for her age and activity level. Okay. So, um, Hey, Ro reverse. You <laughs> Guys, I love y'all. Okay. He's ate a tremendous, a lot of beef for protein. He worked out for years. So did you say how, 38? Okay. Perfect. Perfect. We're not talking about a child. Now I want to, I want to address the beef. So my opinion, this is my opinion that I have lotion all over my sleeve. You guys, that's driving me nuts. Let's flip that away. So I don't have to look at it. Neither do you. Um, my opinion only, like I, I know that some doctors are back on board with it. You guys, I've been studying this stuff for a long time. I just didn't understand insulin resistance. Like I've been searching because I knew I had health issues. So there, there were some books called eat right for your body type, eat right for your blood type. Okay. The eat right for your blood type. Many doctors are still embracing that. So that's where I'm leaning to this with is that some people and Dr. Yao, who's I point back there because his book is on my shelf right now. Dr. Yao. Okay. He does, has this book, Why Calories Don't Count. He also talks about how our genetics play a part in how we metabolize food. Because when we talk about genetics, what we're really talking about is centuries of, of a certain type of people living in an area, eating a certain way. Um, like people in the Mediterranean had availability to food more often. So, you know, some people just are not as adept at fasting as others of us. I, my people came from the Great Lakes area, uh, Chippewa. And so we had, we had times of feast where we had tons of food. And then we had harsh winters where we didn't have a lot of food. So our bodies were adapted for fasting. We also were adapted for eating red meat. Um, a lot of cranberries. I still love cranberries. When they're in season, I buy the heck out of cranberries. They're very, very good for you. Um, but so I'm going to be very different genetically than like my friend who comes from the Dominican. They had a different diet. So red meat is not bad for everyone is where I'm getting to. What I encourage everyone to do every day is pay attention to your body and what works with your body. Just because like, I know Jordan Peterson has been doing red meat only, right? That's all he eats. I think you guys, I, I, I mean, this is opinion. This is opinion, not based on, on, on any scientific paper I've read, but for my gut is that I don't think when you go too far one way or another, that it's going to be long-term healthy for you. It may get you results in the short term, but I think the long-term implications on your health can be devastating if you're not having some balance in your life. The protocol that Jeep Girl and Janet and Janice and Ro are on is that it allows us to have our lifestyle our way, fit our eating with our genetics, our body type, or all of that, and still get consistent results and still keep our health under control. So Ro Reverse Jeep girl's telling her she's down five pounds this morning. Um, all right. So I hope that makes sense with your son. That's 38. I don't, I, I am not buying into the belief that eating red meat is bad for everyone. For some people, it may not match your, your body genetics. And so then, yeah, maybe you want to eat more fish and chicken and, you know, they're like, uh, goat meat because cows were, were so heavy on the landscape in like France. That's why we have brie and whatnot. Um, they probably do better with that. No, 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 no. So there is some truth to genetics as in, are we eating the right things for us? Yes. Do genetics mean you have to go on medications? Holy crikey. So the other part of what we call genetics is if you look, love my mama, I'm going to say I love my mama, but I want you to understand I had an aunt who was a nurse 
and we had a family, you know, my grandma, like they said, um, loving you is feeding you. And, and I kind of do that with my family too, right? That's our love language is feed you. And, and I'm native. And so like when you go to a native's house, like you better just be prepared to eat and don't say no. Cause that's rude. You, you just eat cause they're feeding you cause they love you. Um, that's, that's, that's in my timeline. So is that really my physical genetics or is that culture? Okay. I think what doctors are getting confused is the difference between genetics, something we can measure physiologically and culture, something that we've learned to do because it's what our family does. It's because it's what the people around us do. You know, when you're eating highly fried foods all the time, are you going to start to have problems? Yeah. Is that genetics or is that culture? My auntie, I would go to her house and auntie on the white side. Um, she would go, I would go to her house and her kids are having apple pie and ice cream for breakfast. And I'm like, what the heck? Even as a kid, I'm like, what the heck? And she was like, look, they're getting in fruits, they're getting in grains and they're getting in dairy. Remember the old food pyramid? So that's what she fed her kids every, not every morning, but most mornings and or cereal with milk because that's healthy and some fruit juice, right? Well, now we all have diabetes. You know, my mom, we would go traveling even as a, a young mother, I would go with her. She owned a floral shop and I did for a while as well. And so we would go to these florist conventions. And so we would have to travel from uh, Northwestern Montana and North Northern Idaho over to Washington to do these things to learn all about floral and putting stuff together. You guys have had a very diverse life and I love that I've had a very diverse life, but so her idea of breakfast was, Oh, we're, they're going to have breakfast when we get there. It was donuts, orange juice, coffee, and maybe some milk. Why are we sick? Is that genetics? Is that culture? And it got to the point where I was like, mom, I'm not going if we're not going to stop someplace and get some protein in for breakfast. This was before I understood insulin resistance, but I started understanding how my body felt. This was years before I found out about the insulin resistance piece, but I still knew that I could not survive, that I had energy crashes, that my body hurt, that, you know, it was just causing all kinds of problems to have breakfasts like that. So I was like, I'm not going if we're not going to stop someplace that I can get some protein and, you know, some eggs, something in for breakfast. So we're taught and we're trained and that's what makes us sick. And I'm not saying that as somebody did something to hurt us, right? My family did it out of love. They were like, we love you. We want to feed you. We want to take care of you because making people, you know, especially now I have to understand that like my mom, my auntie. And my dad even came from times of severe poverty where they just did not have food. So food for them was a luxury. My mom grew up watching my grandma not eat until everyone else had eaten so that the whole family would have food. She would spend hours cooking. She would do all the stuff. She would not touch a bite of food until the whole family had eaten. That's culture. That's not genetics. How we eat and how we view food as love is culture not genetics. So we need to kind of, um, or I'm, I, I should stop saying we need to, I'm going to invite everyone to start understanding those things. When we talk about food as culture, that's what's leading us to be insulin resistant today. There's a reason why these instances of, of type two diabetics, which is called, used to be called acquired diabetes is now happening to kids at six years of age why kids at six years of age have non-alcoholic fatty liver. When fatty liver disease was only ever found in people with alcoholism before, why are we seeing it in kids who've never had a drop to drink? Their parents live clean. Like, how is this happening? It's the culture, the environment of food that we have today that's causing this. So instead of blaming, oh, it's genetics, now again, I'm not discounting genetics completely, but when we're looking at insulin resistance, the genetics is more culture and we just need to take a look at what we're eating and how we're eating it. And that's going to tell us what's happening with our body. 
And regardless, if it was genetics, is that shot that they're giving him or that pill that they're giving him changing his genetics to deal with the food that he's eating? No, it's not. It's not. It's not changing anything in his DNA. It's not changing anything that's going to make that long-term healthy impact for him. It's driving numbers down. It's driving um, metrics down so that the doctor can say, hey, look, I took care of this. But the person still is suffering. Maybe non-metrically, they're still having issues. They're, they're having fibromyalgia type pain, pain throughout the body that, that the doctors can't explain. Um, a number of things happening. So when we talk about that, I'm going to round, start rounding back in, you guys. Our food today, we were talking about red meat. Some people are going to do really great on red meat. I still feel like we need to have some um, fiber and whatnot in our diet. I don't know. If somebody can tell me um, any culture that just did not have any in their system, I would love to hear that and I'd love to go look at that. But historically, even though there were some people who ate more meats, they still had some fiber in their diet and the meats were cleaner, by the way, right? And then there were there were cultures, and so this leads into the blood type thing, that had more fish and, and fresh grown foods, right? So, yeah, um, I will, I think what I'm going to do, Jeep Girl, is... I was thinking about it last night because over the weekend I spend time with my family more, which is what I encourage everybody to do. But I think I might take some of these live streams and um, figure out a way some over the weekend back to back. I've seen other people doing it. So if I can just replay this so he can hear some of the information, um, I, I will try and do that today to figure that out because it's been on my mind for a while. So how about we do that? And then on the weekends, you guys, whether I'm live or not, you'll be able to re-listen to some of this information. Um, so some people do really well on red meats. Some people do not. Some people do better on a vegan diet. Some people do not. And so I don't think when we do talk about genetics, we can all be thrown in the same basket as far as that goes. Again, that's why I love the protocol that I haven't addressed yet, but I love the protocol because it allows you to be wherever you are, whatever culture and whatever genetics you are and still be able to get success like Jeep Curl and Janice and uh, Roe have gotten and and uh, Jason who's often on here and my daughter and a number of people, thousands of people, if not millions worldwide have been able to use this and, and start to feel better. So what's happening is the food we're eating is turning into glucose in our system far too quickly, okay? So that's, this is the culture part. Not only are we eating foods in a different way than we used to, like we've always loved food that tasted good. Throughout time, we've tried to make our food taste better, right? But there was a point in time where we understood that that food was fuel, that, right, we're fueling our bodies. We're not just trying to get in all the sugary, empty calories and, and live on of that. And they were treats. When I grew up, we didn't have desserts, we didn't have candy, we didn't have all that stuff all day long, although we had the grains and stuff in the morning, right? That was not good. But desserts were like really Saturday night, Sunday afternoon after church. We didn't have them all week long. And we've transitioned into the society where some households feel like they have to have dessert all the time and it's causing dis-ease in our bodies. So when we're eating these foods that are high in sugars or that have been stripped of fibers that turn into sugars, makes them high on the glycemic scale, too quickly it's causing this production of too much of the hormone insulin in our system. When that happens, we become, we have, it goes from having too much sugar, too much of that converts into sugar in the bloodstream all at once, now the body's going kind of into panic mode and it says, I have to take care of this. There's way too much glucose in the bloodstream. So it calls on the pancreas to create insulin, a hormone that transports that sugar throughout the body to all the cells in the body for energy. It's energy. Like it's like flipping a light switch. Okay. The wires are like your insulin. Like that's the energy carrying that to the light bulb and then the cells turn on and they get the energy they need. Okay. Okay. So, but when we have too much insulin for too long or hyperinsulinemia, it eventually becomes 
insulin resistance where the, those cells in the body start to be like, nope, and that light switch no longer works and the light's no longer coming on and now we have problems. Some of them, it's like the light switch gets stuck on and it's working all the time and it's too much that way. So like if you have skin tags, that's a sign of insulin resistance and that's skin cells that are hyper producing or producing way too much in, re in response to the excess amounts of insulin in our body. Other cells start to shut down. Now we're sick. And so what we really need to do is, is mediate the sugars we eat, pay attention to the foods that we eat. And I'm going to give you the six simple steps, but we also need to make sure that the sugars that we do eat, because we're in a specific culture and life, right? That those sugars aren't converting into the bloodstream so quickly so that it helps reduce the need for high amounts of insulin in the body. So um, the six tips that I talk about are these. Um, if you will do this, you need to get in fiber first before you eat every time you eat. So you guys, I feel like I'm never looking at this camera up here and I need to fix that. Um, then you need to get in proteins and prioritize proteins. You should be then filling up with fats then you want to limit those carbs. You want to do some time-based eating. When we talk about genetics, the one thing that we know is we weren't eating all the time like we do now. We just weren't. Do some time-based eating, okay? And then move your body. We are also far more sedentary than we ever have been in history. These devices have us sitting on our butts and we're getting wider and our joints are failing and our ligaments are failing and so much. So those are the six simple tips. Now the fiber, um, there are days when I get in a good variety of fiber before I eat, but I live alone. I don't always, I only eat two meals a day. It's hard for me to get through all of that all the time. So I supplement my fiber. Okay. And I'm going to show you that in a second. Then um, the protein. Most of the people that I've worked with are only getting in 20 to 30 grams of protein, and that's just not enough. Your muscles need protein to build. Also, protein converts into glucose in the system. It, it spikes your insulin just a little bit because most of it's going into building in the muscles, but some of it's going to energy, okay? Then, and I'm not talking about getting 120 grams of protein. For most of us, that's not healthy if you don't have that type of activity. So um, then fill up with healthy fats and don't fear them. The one, one of the things I like to talk about to people because I think it's so damning to our health is the seed oils. And I'm going to go off on a tangent, tangent time. Um, the seed oils, the canola oil, canola is a man-made plant, by the way. Um, the first part of it is from Canada because it was it was developed in Canada, but it's it's a, a genetically made plant. It's not natural. So um, and so is broccoli. But when we look at those things, what I want you guys to think about is if you can squeeze it and get oil out of it, that's probably a good oil to have. If you can't, then it's probably not the oil you should be putting in your body. And to add to that, Rockefeller. Rockefeller, developed seed oils, vegetable oils, because they were like, well, we have this. So like they're stripping corn and everything from the, it's, it's cob. That's the one I use because it's the one that comes to my mind all the time. But you have all this husk and the cob left over after they've canned and frozen everything. And they're like, what are we going to do with this? We just don't want to waste it. So they found that if they drenched it in hexane and, and super compressed it, they could get oil out of it. That oil had a high flash point. It was developed as a machine oil. Okay. So number one, it's not an oil that was nature was intending for us to ingest large amounts of. Um, and if you think about the seeds that you have to press to get the amount of oil out of it, would it have been healthy for you to eat that amount of seeds to get that oil? Nope. Okay. So, and anyway, so it's also then drenched in this hexane, this solvent. Hexane is a very powerful solvent to extract that oil from the bulk of the plant. Now, what happened is they were like, well, hey, you know, this is working really good. It has a high flash point. Um, we went and said that the saturated fats are bad. Thank you, Ansel Keys. And so they're like, hey, we can process, we can market this as a food oil because it's made from food. You guys have to be careful with your food. It's made from food. So we're going to process it. We're going to market it as a 
healthy oil, a healthier alternative to those saturated fats that Ansel Keys was talking about that were so supposedly so bad for us. So now when we go to restaurants and we have these oils that they're cooking in, do you, have you guys ever wondered why they can put an oil that's made from food into a, a vat and, and heat it to such a high degree and heat it over and over and over again and it not break down or cause a fire? Is that something you want in your body? Just Just take a moment and think about that. Now for me, I knew this. I still just was like, I'm like everybody else. We have knowledge, but we're like, okay, okay, that's great. But, you know, maybe not all of it sinks in right away for us. And so we continue to do it, and then you get sick. Since I started the protocol, I know when I get a hold of seed oils, when I go out to eat and something is fried and those oils are heavily fried in those oils because I'm in the restroom and my stomach hurts and I start having gastritis type symptoms. Well, why is it that I can have coconut oil? I can have avocado. I can have extra virgin olive oil. I can have, I cook in butter real, but I make sure that it's whole milk, real butter. Um, I cook in butter. We can have ghee. We can have the animal fats and I don't get sick like that. It's when we take that animal fat chicken and fry it that I get sick. It's when we have, you know, like I don't eat French fries and stuff anymore because it's like uh, starches with oils that are bad, the, the double duty, okay? So pay attention to your body. Pay attention to the clues. Cushing's disease can be related to insulin resistance. Patty B, though, I'm not willing to talk about it today because I have not read enough about that particular disease because not enough people have asked me about it. However, I'm willing to put it on my list and do some research this weekend and do a video about it next week and maybe talk about it more next week. Because y'all know, as I learn stuff, I like to just like talk about it. Um, but I'm more than happy to look into that for you and do a video on it. Is that all right with you? But I do remember in all of my reading and stuff, it being mentioned, um, the link and actually hearing some doctors talk about it. So that's something I'm more than happy to look into. Thanks for asking. I, and thanks for your trust, you guys. Really, if I don't, I, I try not to be like, I know everything, because I don't. I'm just a person like you guys. I just have a different mind that likes to do all this stuff. I literally, when I rest, I go sit on the couch and I listen to either, I'm watching stuff on how to do art or I'm listening to doctors or whatever. Okay, so. The six simple tips that I gave you, so make sure you're getting in those fats. And then carbs, you guys, the one one of the other things I want to have you guys understand. And I bring this up because I didn't need, I didn't know this before I started powerlifting, right? You have three different macros in your in your food, fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. So think about your food like this. If it's not a fat and it's not a protein, then it is a carbohydrate. So yes, that means vegetables, that means fruits, that means all of it. The difference is how much fiber is in the carbohydrate you're eating because fiber is a non-digestible carbohydrate. So if it's something like potatoes that don't have a lot of fat, uh, a lot of fiber in them, especially when you've taken the skin off, they convert to sugar quicker in your system. So pay attention to that and understand that people will say, well, I don't eat carbs. I just eat, you know, corn or peas. Peas are really high in carbohydrates, by the way, very low in, in um, fiber. Unless you're eating the shell, I love like baby peas, um, but they do have a high amount of, of uh, sugar in them. So Ma Melba is asking, what kind of real whole milk butter do you I use? I use Kerrygold. It's an Irish butter that at most has some salt in it. So it's whole cream butter with some salt in it. Kerry I'll type it in. Uh, do you guys over here on TikTok know what that what I'm talking about? But that's the butter that I buy. And then you can check your butter and it comes in the, here in the US the the carry gold comes in like a gold foil package or it's like a box but it looks like gold foil or silver. So the gold one has salt in it and the silver one is unsalted. Um but that's the butter I use and that's all I cook in really. I will use olive oil when it's appropriate. Um, and then, like I've said many, many times, I have coconut oil around 
not just for dietary purposes, but for health purposes. It's great for the skin. It's great for bacterial infections. It's great for wounds, yada, 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 yada. The coconut oil is amazing. Okay. So um, I will probably start ingesting a little bit of coconut and MCT oils tomorrow as well as I start getting my system used to food again. Tomorrow night, my grandson would, is going to be here and he's so sweet. He tells me, well, we're not going to have pizza, Nana, because I know that you can't have pizza and that it hurts you. Again, pay attention to the foods that hurt you. Don't eat them. So this protocol that I've been talking about before I hop off, do you, what do I think of Celtic salt? Um, I use pink Himalayan salt. Uh, I have nothing against Celtic salt. I just choose to use pink Himalayan salt. So um, the protocol is a tea that I drink in the morning. That's what I have in this cup here. It gives me energy. It gives me, um, it helps shut down my hunger. This is what, it doesn't break my fast. It doesn't spike my insulin. So I've had these two things during this fast. I've had tea and I've had water for five days and I'm fine. Like, do I look cranky? No, I'm pretty happy today. Um, but the tea in the morning, it shuts down your hunger. It helps you burn fat for fuel. It um, gives you components to your brain that are helping with your wellness, helping with anxiety and depression. It's amazing. I start my day with this. And then uh, Jeep Girl will talk about that because that just reminded me when we, we switch the fast, what does that look like? Then before I eat anything, because I'm not getting in this big variety because I'm not a person who has these big bowls, and maybe one day I'll shift into that a little bit more. I don't have these big bowls of diverse varieties of vegetables. So I supplement. You guys, eating a green salad before your meal is a good start, but it's not giving you the diversity of fibers that you need to mediate the amount of sugars that we eat. So it really takes a number of fibers, and there are specific fibers that have been proven to reduce blood sugar levels and not all, you're not going to find them in salads and stuff. So you need to make sure you're getting those in. Um, this, this stuff, I have the other bottle down there too, the green one. This stuff does not have those in there. So um, it might marginally work, but it's not going to do the job that we need it to do to help reverse insulin resistance like this. 10 minutes before I eat, I have one of these. Then I don't have to worry. Now, if I sit down like tomorrow, I'm going to go get that amazing salad from the Indian restaurant. Um, the, the vegan salad, and that's part of how I'm going to break my fast tomorrow. I will still eat, drink this before that salad. I drink this before I eat anything. Okay. Anything. And so tea in the morning, this before my first two biggest meals of the day. Now, why this, those fibers are seven different fibers in there. They're, um, soluble and unsoluble fibers. And that's important. It, it, it shouldn't just be one kind or the other. Psyllium husk is unsoluble. It's great for cleaning you out, but it's not great for slowing down carbohydrate intake or uptake in your system. So I drink that for those reasons. It helps me feel full quicker because it's filling up. It actually gels up. It's not just water in my gut. It can starts to expand and create this gel. When that happens, then this gel is coating my gut and sitting in the bottom of my, my belly. When I eat, then that food drops into that. And now this is coating those foods and slowing down so that I am not having those foods converted into sugars as quickly, keeping the sugar spikes down, keeping my insulin levels down. It's what got me insulin sensitive and got me off of 10 different medications. Two years ago, I have not been on a prescribed medication since. Um, and my, my diabetes is reversed. If I were to go to a doctor today and they were to just do my blood work, they would not even have a clue that I ever had a diagnosis of diabetes. My blood pressure this morning, I took it before the live and it was at 116 over 71. I'm not on blood pressure medications. My blood pressure before the system, before the protocol was 180 over 150 every day. And the best we could get it to was 150 over 110 on dual therapy, trying to get it down. Now, none of those meds that are damaging your body, your kidneys, your liver, all of that. I just have this, which is real food products. It doesn't interfere with the medications you may be on. It doesn't interfere with anything else you're doing. And um, that's it. So somebody asked about lunch. Um, I don't know where that came from. I think there was a message somewhere. <laughs> on one of these things, there was a message. And so right now I'm not doing lunch because I'm at the f day five of a five-day fast. And um, so 
no lunch. But if I was doing the protocol, so this is a 16 hour fast. You guys, part of the reason I love the protocol is that you can start it with a 12 hour fast. You can work into a 16 hour fast. I coach you through all of that. Like um, Jeep girl was saying, Jim has been helping her with um, her coaching. We, all of us that are authorized coaches help with that. So look, before I keep talking about it, this is where you're going to find the system. If you just go to my profile link and then tap on that, that will take you to my profile page right there, right under these red light symbols. You're going to see that link. Yours will look black. Um, mine always is red on the computer. Once you click on that link, it's going to take you to this page where there's the ordering link right at the top. I'm not going to go through all of that today. You'll see when you get there, you get 30 of the drink for morning. You get 60 of the pre-meal drink. And the one thing I'll say is, well, maybe I will go to that page just because I want you guys to understand this. So when you get here, make sure it says referred by Michelle Fayon at the top. You're going to click the buy now button. You'll get here. 30 of the drink. It comes in lemon or lemon ginger that you have in the morning, hot or cold. Um, 60 of the pre-meal drink. Right now, this apple crush flavor is out. Get it while it's out. They did a limited run of it. So if you want to try it, it's amazing. It's my favorite flavor. Um, get that. The lime only lasted just over a month, you guys. So get it while you can. You can get the orange anytime. Okay. Love the orange, but you can get it anytime. Orange tastes like a light orange creamsicle. Apple crush has a, has a great fresh apple taste, a little bit tart, not super tart. But anyway, so you get... 30 of the tea, 60 of the pre-meal drink. I would encourage you, it'll show up just like this, already selected, and then just leave it on subscription. Our subscription is different. Like, I'm already having problems with some people that I did subscription for for some different things. I've written them and said cancel it. I called them and said cancel it, and it still shows up. We don't do that to you. You get a five-day email that says your subscription is getting ready to be shipped. You have the chance to, if you want to change those flavors, maybe you want to try lemon ginger, maybe you want to add something, whatever. You can do that. You can cancel it. You can whatever. But the subscription saves you $5 off of the total price. So you're at about $5 a day for the product. You're not paying for shipping with that. So now you're saving about $15. And you get this handy dandy um, mixer with it the first time you order. That helps mix like the tea and stuff. You also get a bottle like this in your first kit. So I, there, and there's lines on the back that tell you how much water to put in. I like more water than this for the tea and I like less water than this for the balance. So you guys, it does come down to preference. It's so flexible. So I usually use up to about here for the water for my balance. And then you got to drink it down quick because it's going to thicken up. So there's that. And you guys, when you do that, I send you out emails. I send you out a video that tells you how to use it. I start texting you to support you and help you along the way and um, make sure that you're getting what you need out of the system. You get a 90 day money back guarantee. No questions asked. You get a quality guarantee. We test it. We triple test the products. So they're tested when they come in as the botanical form. They're tested at a point during this, the processing, and then they're tested before they're packaged and shipped out to make sure that it meets the standards and has everything in it that we're telling you that it does, or it just doesn't go out. Um, so, all of that. Now, I was having a conversation. Uh, uh, let me answer Melba really quick. Melba says, I'm sorry, Melba, I took so long to get to this one. Says her daughter has celiac disease. If she gets anything that has flour, she gets bad sick. Is this insulin resistance too? So there is some, some um, research that's showing that celiac disease is highly linked to insulin resistance. Am I going to tell you that insulin resistance is the only thing that causes it? There's not enough research to say that. But um, we've noticed that people with IBS, Crohn's, and celiac start feeling better after using the system. Now, celiac is, is like some, celiac is like, uh, okay, so if we take insulin resistance and we go to diabetes type 2, insulin resistance is here, diabetes type 2 is here. Gluten intolerance is here. Celiac is here. What I can tell you for me with my, and I have celiac in my family and I was highly gluten intolerant, would have diarrhea, swollen joints, all of the stuff when I would eat bread. I can now eat bread. I don't overeat it, but I don't have all of those issues. Um, so you start to, when you get the inflammation down in your gut, when you're 
gastrointestinal system and the gut flora, that microbiome in your gut, starts to level out and become more healthy, you start to notice that you'll have less um, problems with anything that's inflammatory related, anything that's allergy related. Allergy is, an, is a disorder of inflammation. Um, and I was recently listening to some doctors who were not talking about the system, but they were just saying that they all autoimmune disease is related to inflammation, and they're linking that back to the inflammation and the disorder in the gut that we have today. So not only does this, and this has a lot of, it doesn't have probiotics in it. Somebody was misrepresenting that. This does not have probiotics in it. It has prebiotics. It has the stuff that feeds your own natural probiotics. So what happens is, is it starts taking a very negative gut microbiome, and it starts increasing the, the positive and balancing that out. So it's called balance. There's a reason for that, right? Balance because we're balancing out a number of things. We're balancing out your your uh, your insulin levels. We're balancing out your gut microbiome, all of that. So um, I have some weird message. Okay. Can I use corn flour? I don't worry about what flour I use now. Corn, by the way, you guys, is high in the glycemic scale. So corn is one of those things. There was another um, another book I read years ago, and it was, it was talking about all this stuff years ago, and then some people were trying to discredit it. But out of the things that were, were causing most reactions and um, inflammation in the body, besides milk and wheat, was corn. That was in the top 10 inflammatory foods. Um, according to this doctor and the research they had done. So um, I don't really substitute flowers, maybe oat flour once in a while, but I don't even worry about it anymore because the protocol has made my gastrointestinal system work so much better. Like now on day five, I've had no food and it's amazing to me what's happening to my body as um, I'm cleaning out stuff, not only from my gastrointestinal system, but from probably from my organs, my liver, um, so you still, even though I haven't eaten for five days, you still eliminate a lot. Um, I would, if I was doing a 10 day fast, I would still be eliminating a lot on 10 days because your body's now starting to use up all of those things that just need to go. So corn flour, um, I can use it. I, by the way, now, now you got me hungry for that too. I have not had um, cornbread, corn muffins. That used to be like a fall favorite for me. Guys, I'm hungry. A big bowl of chili and some corn muffins. Whew, that, that was some fall food, favorite food for me. And I learned how to make chili much healthier now. So I love chili and I would probably have some corn muffins with it. And I might even do that this weekend. Thanks, you, Nadine. <laughs> okay, so um, the protocol has just really helped, you guys. And it's helped so many. So if you have questions, that same link that I showed you where you can purchase by the way, there's a number of things. I have a full website there that explains this. Has some 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 um, success stories in it. It also uh, now I, I had one person who was upset because obviously I'm a representative and I make money. I do it because it worked for me, or I wouldn't be doing this. So I talk about that a little bit in the website. It's not that I'm gonna try and and like sell you on that. If you're interested in making income or changing your life in that way like I did. Great. I'm here for that. But I'm the most important thing for me is that people start to get their health back. Then we address anything else if it's applicable. But the website goes over everything. In fact, there's an entire page just for Unimate. There's an entire page just for the balance so that you guys can go in and read all about the things it does um, and what can happen for you. Now, that information all I compiled from uh, the company websites across the globe because every website's a little different and you know how people want to hear information. I like it all, so I put it all in one page for you. But there's also a way to get a hold of me there. There's a Facebook group that I have where I post daily in there, except for not on the weekends. And there's um, my recommendations, which has the books and stuff that I use. And I am supposed to be working this weekend on getting some of the Qigong exercises that I've been doing into that recommendations page, some of the things that I do for gentle exercise. All right, so use that link because there's a way a lot more there than just trying to sell you the six simple steps. There's, um, you can, uh, 
download that ebook by using one of the links in there and that's free you're not you're not um, having to pay me for that that's just to help you get along your way on being insulin sensitive so i am going to take a break go for a walk and produce some content for you guys so watch out for the reels today thanks for your interaction um i will be back at three and then I will show up at some point on the weekend if I have time. Jeep Girl, thanks for all your questions today. Appreciate it. And uh, we'll talk to you all later. Have a good one.